After our time with first order equations, we are now going to move on to second order linear equations. These equations will themselves take up close to half of the course, and with good reason. Second order linear differential equations are both reasonably approachable and useful in a wealth of real world applications. They are the most important class of DEs to study, at least until we get to partial derivatives. A second order linear differential equation has this form. Since this is second order, this is a second derivative, as well as a first derivative and the function itself. Since this is a linear equation, all the terms are added up with coefficients. The coefficients can be other functions of t, the independent variable. There is also a function f of t on the right, and this is the only expression where the function y doesn't show up in the expression as well. If the right side is zero, like with first order linear equations, then the equation is called homogeneous. To solve a linear equation, it's going to be very useful to consider the corresponding homogeneous equation where the right side is simply set to zero. As with first order equations, using an operator is very helpful to, for the notation. Here is the most general linear, linear operator for second order equations, with coefficient functions a, b, and c. Then a second order linear DE can be written ly equals f. Interpret this as a question. What function y has the property that when I apply the linear operator, I get the function f? If this is homogeneous, then what function y has the property that when l is applied, the result is zero? y is always the unknown, the goal, and the linear operator is a nice, succinct notation to talk about what is happening to y. In this chapter, we're going to talk about co just constant coefficients. The most general linear operator L has coefficient functions a, b, and c, and these can be any functions of t in general. However, they can also be constant functions, just numbers. I want to consider the operator L where a and b and c are constants, and ask what function y satisfies Ly equals f of t, or Ly equals zero over the homogeneous case. The function f of t is still a function. The constant coefficients are just for the operator. The equations that result from this setup are second order constant coefficient linear differential equations, or if you wish, Sokoldes. It's nice to have an acronym to refer to these. The main reason to devote an entire chapter of the course to these Sokoldes is their applications. These DEs model some of the most fundamental interactions in physics, as well as in other disciplines. For the most part, we're going to talk about harmonic motion, anything that has elasticity, that behaves like a spring. This is guitar strings, to shocks on a car, to tension on a bridge cable, to trampolines. All of these are harmonic motion, and their main behavior is governed by a second order constant coefficient linear differential equation. Let's set this up. Hooke's law says that a mass, if a mass on a spring is displaced d units from equilibrium, then the force in the spring that pulls it back to equilibrium is f equals negative kd. k is a number called the spring constant. It measures the stiffness of the spring. Large k is a stiff spring that will lead to a strong force, and small k is a less stiff spring that will lead to a milder force. I want the displacement from equilibrium to be the function I'm looking for, y of t. An object on a spring, or any object of harmonic motion, is described by a function of time. At each point in time, it is displaced some value y of t, positive or negative, depending on which side of the spring. This is only one dimensional movement, but that is enough to model a lot of harmonic motion. Okay, that's Hooke's law. Now, this is classical physics. So motion is determined by Newton's first law, f equals ma. But a is acceleration, and that's just the second derivative of position, and position is just this displacement function y of t. So Newton's first law is f equals m times the second derivative of y. Well, then I can make these two equal, since they are both force on the spring. Finally, I can pull everything to the left. What results is this equation? This is a second order linear differential equation with constant coefficients, and it is even homogeneous. If I match it up to the linear operators, I now get an interpretation of the constants. The constant I called a before becomes m, and it is the mass of the object undergoing harmonic motion. c becomes the spring constant, the strength of the system to pull back to equilibrium. 
B is zero so far, but I'll return to an interpretation for B soon. So I have this first Sockel D. What is its solution? You can check, if you wish, that sine and so cosine solve this equation with the frequency coefficient of square root of k over m. For second order linear equations, I expect two linearly independent solutions, solutions which are not multiples of each other. Sine and cosine are these solutions. If I have two super solutions, then by superposition, the general solution is a linear combination of these two, a sine plus b cos. So this y of t is the full solution to the second order constant coefficient linear differential equation. This hopefully makes some sense. Objects on a spring should oscillate. Sinusoidal motion is exactly what is expected. If I pull a pendulum and then let go, it will swing back and forth, exactly described by a sine or a cosine wave. I want to make one technical note before moving on. The general solution is the sum of two waves and the two waves have the same frequency coefficient. The sum of two waves is in fact still another sine wave, since the frequencies match up. The amplitudes, A and B, of the two terms might be different, however. There is a re lovely result, which I won't prove, but it shows that the amplitude of the resulting wave is the square root of A squared plus B squared. I call this the Pythagorean combination of A and B. This fact will be useful in a future video. The previous solution produces sine and cosine waves. Sine and cosine waves continue to oscillate forever. But this is not how springs work in the world. They slow down, oscillations get slower and fade. Well, the reason for this is friction in the system. So far, there isn't any friction present in the system, but I can add it by changing Hooke's law. Now the force is a combination of two things, the old Hooke's law piece, negative ky as before, but also something that depends on dy dt dy dt is speed, and friction depends on speed. Something at rest has no friction, but the faster something is moving, the more friction it produces. Therefore, I have this term, negative b dy dt, the force due to friction, which wants to slow down the oscillation. Well, then I have the other pieces as before, Newton's law, and the equation I get where the forces are made equal. If I bring everything to the left, I get a new homogeneous Sockel d. Now it does have a middle term, and I can interpret the coefficient b, it is the coefficient of friction. A second order, constant coefficient, linear differential equation, has three constant coefficients. And now they all have interpretations. The first is mass, the second is the coefficient of friction, and the third is the spring constant. I'm going to use this interpretation heavily for the next number of videos. So far, this has just been a homogeneous Sockel d. But I can add a non-homogeneous term on the left, f of t. What does this mean? Well, this is an equation of forces, so f of t must be a force as well. It is unrelated to y of t, so it's not part of the spring on its own. That means it must be an external force. f of t is something else that is pushing on the system. If there is a child on a swing, then f of t is that child's friend or parent pushing the swing applying an external force that changes the behavior of the motion. This is now a complete interpretation. Second order, constant coefficient linear differential equations measure harmonic motion with mass, friction, spring constant, and external forces all present. Before moving on to actual solution techniques, I want to talk about the second major interpretation of these Sockel Ds, alternating current circuits. The DE that describes alternating currents is exactly the same as that for harmonic motion, but the interpretation of each of the coefficients is quite different. Instead of a position function that describes the system, a charge function is the function in question. The movement of that charge will be the alternating current. In this system, there are four components to a circuit, resistors, capacitors, inductors, and an external electromotive force. Let me describe each of these in turn. Resist resistors allow for energy leaving the system, and they represent the resistance to energy flow. The resistance is written R and measured in ohms. It acts like friction in the mechanical system in that it wants to slow down the flow of current. Resistance will result in a decrease of current over time, and if there is no external forcing, all the current will eventually be gone. Resistors represent the devices powered by the current, whatever those devices are, as the parallel of friction, resistance should show up as the coefficient dq dt. 
Capacitors are storage devices for electrical energy in electric fields. They have a measurement C called capacitance, which has units of farads, coulombs per volt. They stabilize alternating current flow, and such they can be seen as controlling the natural way in which current flows. This idea, up to a reciprocal, aligns with the idea of a spring constant, which represents the stiffness of the spring and controls the natural behavior of the harmonic system before the friction and external forces. As an analog of the spring constant, capacitance should show up as the coefficient of Q of T. Inductors are storage devices for electrical energy in magnetic fields. They have a measurement L called inductance, which has units of Henry's. Inductors block alternating currents, as such they represent the difficulty of moving charge through the system. In the harmonic system, the difficulty of moving the object is its mass. Indeed, a simple de definition of mass is a measure of how difficult it is to move an object. As the analog of mass, inductance should show up as the coefficient of, DQ, D, of the second derivative of Q. Rather. Electromotive forces are external forces to the system, from batteries to generators. They are written e of, e of t and have units of volts. Like the forces that add movement to a harmonic system, these electromotive forces add charge to a circuit. Matching up most directly with a harmonic system, the electromotive force should be the non-homogeneous function in a non-homogeneous DE. The parallel of harmonic motion and alternating currents is a great example of a common occurrence in applied mathematics and the study of differential equations. The same DE can describe a variety of seemingly unrelated systems. I find it quite fascinating to think of alternating currents as an electromagnetic analog of springs. Since alternating current is so ubiquitous in the world, this mental model of what is going on with electricity gives me a handle on the strange system of power plants, wires, and devices that affect so much of my life. Now let me actually solve these Sockeldees. In this video, I'll just do the homogeneous case. Future videos will give techniques for systems that have an external force. I'll go back to the talking about springs and harmonic motion, but remember that you could reinterpret all of this as alternating currents if you wish. Here is the general constant coefficient linear operator and the homogeneous equation Ly equals zero. How to solve this? Well, we are just going to guess. Guessing turns out to be pretty common in DE, surprisingly. I'm going to guess that the solution has to be an exponential function. What does this guess mean? I'll put the guess back into the equation to learn something about the coefficient r. If this works, then the guess was right, and if this doesn't work, then the guess was wrong. To put the guess in the system, I need the first and second derivatives. Well, here they are. Then here is the operator. Applying l to e to the rt produces this expression. And I can factor e to the rt out, which leaves a quadratic in r. This is a homogeneous differential equation, so all of this must equal zero, but the exponential function cannot equal zero, so the quadratic must be zero. Therefore, if this guess works, then the coefficient r has to satisfy this quadratic. This is called the characteristic equation associated with the DE. It turns out that understanding this quadratic is enough to understand the DE. To solve the quadratic in general, I use the quadratic formula. There are three cases, depending on the sign of the discriminant, which is the mathematical name for the piece under the square root. If the discriminant is positive, then there are two real roots. If the discriminant is zero, there is one repeated real root. And if the discriminant is less than zero, there are two complex roots. So I look at all these three cases, and each will give solutions to the DE, depending on the coefficients a, b, and c. This is good. I've turned a DE into an algebra problem, and one that I know how to solve. If there are two real roots, r1 and r2, then e to the r1t and e to the r2t are the solutions. And the general solution is a linear combination of these two. This homogeneous second order constant coefficient linear differential equation is solved by two exponential functions. Nice. Look again at the quadratic formula. If a, b, c are all positive, which they are in all the applications, friction, mass, and spring constants all have to be positive numbers. Well, then b squared minus ac is less than b squared. So its square root is something less than b. So the most I can add or subtract in the numerator is something less than b. This means that r must be negative. 
both r1 and r2 are negative numbers, and this means that the result must be exponential decay. Hopefully this makes sense. With sufficient friction, there is no oscillation, just exponential decay to zero. This is called overdamped, and happens when b is large enough, large enough that b squared is larger than 4ac. Enough friction means no oscillations at all, just a system that slowly settles back to equilibrium. The special case of b equals 4ac happens for repeated roots. In this case, the square root term in the quadratic formula is 0, so the root is just negative b over 2a. Again, if a, b, and c are positive, this will be a negative number. There is one solution, e to the, y equals e to the rt, and again this is exponential decay. But there should be two solutions. There's only one root, but I want two solutions. This is sort of a problem. There is a strange trick in linear DEs to produce more solutions when they don't naturally show up, and that's just to multiply by the independent variable. This trick will show up again down the road in the course. I'm not going to spend much time now on why it works here, but it does work. The second solution for a repeated root is t times e to the rt. The result is still exponential decay, but in the second case it is a bit slower. Multiplying by t means that the decay is not as sudden. This case is called critically damped. It's the tipping point, where the friction is just enough to make the system decay back to equilibrium. Finally, I need to talk about the complex roots. Here is the setup of the quadratic equation for the complex roots. b squared minus 4ac is negative, so if I multiply by negative 1, I get 4ac minus b squared, which is positive. Well, then I can factor negative 1 out of the square root, and the square root of negative 1 is i, the special complex number. So the roots can be written as r equals alpha plus or minus i beta, where alpha and beta are these expressions in the original coefficients. The roots become exponential coefficients. Remember, I'm guessing all along that e to the rt is a solution. Well, then I can use the laws of exponents to split this up. I get e to the alpha t, which is exponential decay, if all the coefficients are positive. Alpha is less than zero, like the roots in the previous case. But then the second part is a complex exponent. What do I do with a complex exponent? I use Euler's formula, which was mentioned in the preliminaries at the start of the course. Complex exponentials turn into sine and cosine. And this is the solution for two complex roots. However, this is still a problem. This is a complex function of t, but the motion is actual real motion. It shouldn't have a complex number in it. Well, I can deal with this by using linear combinations. By carefully combining the two solutions, the positive and the negative, I can isolate cosine and sine. Therefore, the two solutions I actually want are e to the alpha t sine beta t and e to the alpha t cos beta t. Now these are real solutions, and the general solution is a linear combination of the two specific solutions. What behavior is this? Well, this is sine and cosine, and they oscillate, but since there is friction, the amplitude of the oscillation has exponential decay, e to the alpha t. I get damped oscillations, oscillations with smaller and smaller amplitude over time. Exactly what I expect. If I set a pendulum in motion, it will slowly decay in amplitude until it comes to rest again. These systems are called underdamped. Something amazing has happened here. To solve the system, to get these solutions, I had to detour through the complex numbers and use Euler's formula to turn the complex solution into sine and cosine. Nothing about the system implies that complex numbers should be necessary, but they are fundamentally a part of the solution. I need to go through the complex numbers to understand the system. This is even more important for electric circuits. This is the first place where it is clear that an AC circuit needs complex numbers for its description. And this, and this is the start of the fundamental and essential way that electricity is described by complex number functions.